Welcome. My name is uh, Sotos Tsaftaris. I come from the University of Edinburgh. I'm the professor in machine learning, computer vision there, also a Turing fellow and the Royal Academy of Engineering Research and Healthcare AI. I'll tell you a bit some of our work with respect to Phenotiki and with respect to some of the lessons we learned trying to design this phenotyping uh, software. Uh, very briefly, I will show you a visual bio. I got my undergraduate degree in computer science and engineering at Aristotle University in Greece. Uh, then I moved to Chicago where I did my PhD. Uh, and then I also stayed on as a professor in computer science and electrical engineering and also radiology. Then I moved for five years in Italy. And then for the last uh, uh, six or so years, I'm here at the University of Edinburgh. And these are some of the pictures of the places uh, I've lived. Um, before, I, we do a lot of work regarding uh, if images. So we work not only on plants, but also in uh, healthcare, in medical imaging, in art. Uh, we've also worked on the problems related to privacy or pri problems related to distributed learning. I lead a group where we try to solve lots of problems with AI and lots of theory, but also lots of applications. So for example, how we can measure the privacy of data and how can we measure the privacy of machine learning models or how we can use causal machine learning as a ways or mechanisms to learning predictions. In this uh, presentation, we will talk about several things. So we will talk about how Phenotiki was created and how it was designed. What, we, what do we do uh, what does tools does Phenotiki have and some of the lessons learned as we try to build Phenotiki. Uh, we will tell you about how phenotyping is changing now with deep learning and how the community helps evolve some of the solutions. And finally, I'll try to give you some advice on how you can develop a software or some, at least on the basis of what we learned and some of the advice uh, in using uh, deep learning. Now, why Phenotiki was created? So we did see that classically phenotyping, and it's probably more of some of you know, it's a very hard process. It's a true bottleneck. So you had to go and measure within the greenhouse or a growth chamber or even outside in the field, the, the phenotypes, and sometimes even in a destructive way. So there was an evolution at some point about 30 years ago where people said we can disentangle, we can break apart the process of measurement from the process of observing. So they started using digital camera and images to help the collection of the visual evidence of the phenotypes. And slowly, automation started thinking of, well, we can think of combining, let's say, the automated imaging aspect of like taking pictures of plants with a semi-automated uh, analysis. Uh, but, and we did see that there was lots of different solutions in trying to make this thing happen. So uh, there will be some affordable ones, but heavily customized or very even highly uh, professionally made uh, commercial solutions. And we observed overall that not all clubs can afford such equipment. They cannot replicate these exact conditions. And largely the know-how remains on companies uh, within labs or several companies. And the high throughput in some sense of high throughput phenotyping was in some sense local to a lab or local to a specific problem, tuned to a specific problem that the, the lab wanted to answer. So we wanted to think of how can we create simple methods uh, that will be able to generalize to a different problems. And this is how it informed the design of Phenotiki. And it was starting as an obsession. It started actually in 2007. I gave a seminar at the University of Chicago. Uh, and they asked me, they were, there were plant biologists and plant scientists, and they asked me, how can they phenotype in an affordable manner? And at that point, I used to own this Canon camera. Uh, and I said, well, why don't you use that camera as intervalometer and try to hook it up and try to be able to use this as a mechanism to image, image plants. And then you can do some simple analysis to extract the mass of images of Aravidopsis. And this was in 2000, uh, then we submitted the first paper in 2009 of how we can use the simple idea of plant phenotyping in a very low cost uh, mechanism. And that actually started informing our idea that we wanted to be able to say, if there are some high, local throughput centers uh, distributed around the world, we wanted to say we wanted to be able to achieve the idea that collectively we can have a high global high throughput. If you imagine that we can have affordable devices uh, scattered around the world, we might be able then to increase the overall throughput as a community of how we can phenotype. And we wanted to do this in a standardized manner. So by standardizing the imaging and by standardizing the analysis. So we came up with this project in the uh, 
like early 2010 of how we can create this in phenotyping infrastructure and a phenotyping open access system, uh, which we now call uh, Phenotiki, uh, where we develop affordable sensors, uh, which are you know kind of smart. They take pictures, they do some processing on the pictures, then they submit them to they send them to the internet, and then on that case there is software that can analyze them either in a desktop or in a cloud-based infrastructure. And the whole idea was to create something that is easy to maintain, easy to deploy transparent to the user and also expandable to other organs and plants. So how, what does Phenotiki have now? So the, first of all, I want to tell you about the setup. So the setup is simple. You take the sensor. It's very easy to build. It's actually based on Raspberry Pi that you can also see uh, here. This is one of the ones I have at home to do several things. Um, you connect it to the internet. There is a graphical interface to set it up. And then there is a uh, graphical interface to analyze the data if you, once you download the data on your desktop, which is a, has a software. And then you can also do it on the uh, on the cloud on the, based on the iPlant infrastructure, now Cyverse, uh, in a batch mode. Okay, so here is some of the um, techniques that we use for for. Um, for analysis, we have ready-made tools for analyzing pot trays, label data for labeling leaves, leaf counting, and data extraction. Okay, um, so and a lot of people have actually been used uh, Phenotiki, and particularly the sensor as a way to collect data. Some of them are these examples. This is from our example, but there are others that have been collecting data using exactly our own uh, uh, phenotyping. Uh, system like the, the hardware. It's open source. Anybody can modify it and, uh, and improve it. And inside the software, uh, the secret is algorithms rooted in machine learning. Because by having um, machine learning, we can be robust to changing environment in different labs. And we can also learn from user interaction and adapt. And once we teach the algorithms, we can uh, do fully automated plant growth uh, for mass fully automated leaf counting and only with two-dimensional images, just simple optical images uh, that we take from the Raspberry um, camera and semi-automated leaf segmentation. And we can extract several traits like PLA, diameter, compactness, stockiness, all, all of these things. So uh, I'll, I'll provide also a video where you can see the software in action uh, with narration so it's easy for you to follow what the software can do. So, Let's talk about some of the lessons we've learned, okay? And this was a big wake-up call for us. Um, so the, the most approaches to lab phenotyping are com co co you know, commercial or customized approaches in well-controlled environments. You will see them often in display in like as closed chambers. All of this, everything's very, very nice controlled. Instead, we wanted to say, well, you know, take the sensor and put it into uh, into your you know, setting and stick it in the growth chamber and be able to phenotype without restrictions. We were surprisingly naive uh, and we realized very quickly that building the sensor and the camera was not the hard part. It actually is getting the phenotype, which is the droop petal neck. Because sometimes actually, if you want to measure, let's say rosette area or the plant size, it's not a hard task. You can think of like this is green and everything is green and everything else is green. So it's very easy for me to measure. But what happens if suddenly now the plant gets starting to wilt uh, or it has underwater stress or there is some water reflection in the background or there is moss growing in the background? So you can see that when the simple task of identifying a green pixel, which is the plant, now becomes much harder. Or the phenotype itself can be complicated. So imagine that I want to delineate and annotate uh, I want to detect every leaf, or I want to measure the size of every leaf because that's what I want to phenotype, or I want to measure the exact time of where a flowering is emerging. So the task now becomes hard. So we did a, we wrote an article a few years back that has become now pretty standard in the literature of that the new bottleneck in plant phenotyping is not uh, it, 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 it is not the hardware, it's the image analysis task, uh, because there is a lot of different things that are trying to solve difficult problems. And it turns out that the, even after, let's say, six years from then, we still have a bottleneck. So 
with the number of specialized software that solve a specific task under specific conditions remains specialized and increases. So we, they do tend to involve classical and deterministic image analysis. So if you think about an easy contrived example, think of, let's say, trying to segment a plant by moving a threshold uh, of the, on the color scale and say, I'm going to take the plant and I pick the threshold T, and this will be fine for my data set. But then somebody wants to use that base software for some other data that will look underwater stressed. So here, new data, you will need a new type of threshold. So we wanted to move away of the idea that we want to pre-bake certain decisions, certain assumptions. So rather than doing that, we wanted to think of, can we teach machines from examples of what we want the output to be? So we will have some images and some desired output and let the algorithms decide what sort of thresholds they should be using. So let's look at an example of this. So let's look at counting leaves as a machine learning problem. So we will have some images, which we will call X, okay? And then we will have the desired number of leaves for those images so that somebody sat down and annotated for us. So we would like to say that we will learn a function y equals f of x, where y is the leaf count, is a number, x is the image, and f is the, 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 the function, the prediction. Okay? So the fundamental problem then is to how to make the computers be able to see data. Okay? Because when we see data, we see an image, versus the computer sees a bunch of numbers. So traditionally has been that there's going to be some sort of like human knowledge that is able to take some of the features of the plant X and write them in a form that extracts some correlations, extracts some information of this image that is able then to provide to a decision function. And that decision is, let's say, the number of the leaves. So before deep learning, we did exactly this idea. We used this human engineering and some of the decision as a way to build this. So we before deep learning, and this is the algorithm that was released in Fenotiki, we will have the image X, and it's a five, 500 by 500 image. We take an image of a single rosette here, and then we will convert this into a long vector. Then we will have a first function that will take the image X and convert it into a, something that is the features Z that will represent the information that we need about the plant. And then we will take the Z and create the count, the leaf count. The funny part is that we can actually learn that Z using unsupervised learning. So we don't need annotations for that, and we can do this offline. And the main concept of how we did that is that what are the parts that make up a leaf? So there could be some straight edges, that is the stem, and some curves and some pointy tips. So we learn these parts, and this representation is basically to make up a leaf, what sort of combination of parts do I need to have? And on the basis of how many combinations I have, I learn how many leaves I will have, okay? And that algorithm was published in, as early in 2015. But now, deep learning is changing phenotyping. So, and it's not only in phenotyping. In fact, it's changing medicine. It's changing autonomous driving. You can, it's changing how we build autonomous drones. It's almost everywhere. It's Alexa, uh, uh, like device, smart device that we have at home where they can recognize our voice. And what is powering this new paradigm is this new class of algorithms, which we call deep learning. And where there are neural networks at massive scale, where we use the major difference is that we learn features for the task, taking advantage of the supervision. So instead of extracting features either by hand or by some sort of unsupervised process and then fit it to the classifier, we now learn this all together. And it's fueled by two things, data and lots of compute power. Okay. So this is a very brief kind of caricature of how deep learning works. So let's say I want to create a system that's going to detect wolf versus dog or cats, some animals. So you take the images, the first layer you learn is like you learn some, some fundamental features, like let's say corners and straight lines and curves. Then the second, you start building the ideas of shapes of, let's say, a snout, ears, uh, 
uh, tails and so on. And then you see what is the combination of these features that will tell a dog versus a horse versus a, a, a rat. You will think of that I can build a system that I can tell cats, dogs, or you know, very angry cats dressed as sharks. So that fundamental idea was used also by us in 2017 to come up with the first leaf counting algorithm in uh, with deep learning. So again, I don't want you to think of focus on the details, but you have an image here and the desired leaf count prediction is out. This is a very, very, very deep neural network. Um, and just by doing this, we were able to improve performance from 50 to 400 percent improvement uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, compared to the previous result. And we also showed that you can use combined different sources, not just for Arabidopsis, you can combine all the data together and you can also use synthetic data. The classical complaint that people have with deep learning is that you don't know whether the algorithm learns well. And this is something that we did very, very simple where we said, well, we'll take an image and we will mask it. And if the count changes, it means it's using that part in terms of a decision. So there will be a box here that shifts and the output here is the, the decision with respect to the ground truth. So if you see white, it means it didn't make, it didn't change, but as you pass over the leaf, you change. So if you cover, let's say this leaf, you will change by minus by one. So you lose that leaf. If you count the center, where in the center you have one or two more leaves together, it goes uh, even smaller. And you can change the size of the box and you can see how much you're including. So in some sense, you can detect the size of the feature that you are um, most sensitive to. Of course, this was not done only by us. There are several others that have tried to use machine learning for plant phenotyping. And these are just few examples that I'm using. In fact, deep learning is becoming so popular now that I have it on purpose, this broke it in two, two parts, that by now, you know, you can see in 2010, the use of deep learning and computer in, in phenotyping has, uh, you know, been kind of like trickling down and trickling. And then suddenly by 2018, we had 80. Well, guess what? How has things changed since 2018? Now we have close to 500 uh, publications alone in 2020, just using deep learning uh, and phenotyping, using this dimensions AI uh, profiling tool. But still to this day, we observe certain things. We observe that in, in some sort of like repetition of customization. Let, let me elaborate on this. So let's say that we need, to, we need to use machine learning to solve a task. It's a count levers of Arabidopsis. What is the process? We obtain some data, we train a model, we evaluate, and we take this to production. Okay? But imagine that we will need to change the task. So need a new task, okay? Uh, count tiers of corn. Again, we will have to go through this loop. Obtain, data, train, evaluate, get into production. So you, you see that although before we will customize the solution, now rather than customizing the solution, which is the software, now we're customizing the networks. So we go from to have customized networks tailored to specific tasks and data seen in training. We rely too much on annotated data. And they become experts in the problem that they try to solve. And these algorithms based on machine learning and based on deep learning do not transfer to another data target task. This is the classical known generalization problem where you still want to develop algorithms that are robust to changes on the imaging sensor, the plant, the genotype, uh, the environment. So we want to go away from being subject experts to something that will work well across different settings. So for example, let, imagine that a plant changes color a bit. It's never been seen before. It's now suddenly stressed. Um, you will have to start over. Worse, if you don't even know that this has happened, you will get wrong results without warning. If you don't have similar training data in the data set, we cannot process it. Okay? So 
we do not know what the neural network learned. So in this is somehow of a game over. We built very weak solutions. We need to continuously supervise where we check the results are okay and we keep continuously evaluate. And there is no optimality guarantee. We don't know if the mistake is going to be too big or too small if things go wrong. So what is it going to do? Is it not going to detect a plant or is it going to detect a too small of a plant or a too big of a plant? And this is largely dangerous. So the classical solution people give to this problem say, well, you know what? That's okay. I will, I will just basically collect, keep collecting more data. So uh, that, I'll, I'll tell you now why this is not the greatest idea. Okay. So I'll use here an example of a car. Okay. And imagine that we have to detect uh, the car. And there is going to be a camera, some tire on top, and there is also light, the sun. So let's say that there are some variables that affect the position of the camera and some variables that affect the position of the light, where it is, uh, the, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Then we will think that there is a texture on the car and a color on the car and where it is located, the car in the scene. Okay. So we will say that we have simply 13 parameters. Okay. And if you think of simply 13 parameters, okay, imagine that we have a thousand possible values of these certain parameters that will characterize all possible cars in the world. Okay. So the, and just, just 1000 for each variable. Okay. So very quickly, we need 10 to the power of 39 images that we need to collect in, we need to label as a way to solve the problem with supervised machine learning. So enumerating all of these possibilities is a combinatorial explosion. So you can really see that just collecting data is not the panacea. So, and on top of that, we know now that both Google, Facebook, they are collecting and using lots and lots of data as a way to develop their algorithms, but they do see that there is no change in performance. So the performance never stops to improve. So that's natural because the more examples you give, the more it will do better. But the problem with phenotyping is, will we ever have enough labeled data to solve the problem? So we need to start thinking in a completely different way. We need to start thinking of how deep learning can truly help uh, by building more smarter uh, solutions. So in the next few slides, I want to give you some ideas of how we're trying to build this smart solution. So let me talk to you about how deep learning actually can truly help. So there are going to be some suggestions that I think will be really powering uh, how we can move forward. One is going to tell you that don't try to solve one task, do more things at the same time, and use knowledge across different domains. Two, make the process of collecting data easier and try to use less than perfect data. And third, openly share knowledge and resources with the community. So let's talk about the first. So I'll show you how, for example, we can work across different data sources for the same task, how we can use to solve different tasks simultaneously, and how can we transfer knowledge to new and unseen data. So here is a paper that we, uh, we, we, uh, we published a few years ago on the Plant Journal, where we use one network to, to solve several different, the same task, but fusing information from different sensors. So we used here optical, near infrared, and uh, fluorescence. So rather than have individual models that are able to solve this, we have uh, agglom an agglomeration, a fusion of information that comes from the different sources. So that we have what we call um, modality processing branches, a fusion branch, and a decision branch. And the decision is the one that does the counting. And this is the first method that works also for night type Im nighttime imaging uh, and uh, monitoring plants during the night. That is the same network that works the same during the day and during the night. So we don't have two different networks. Okay. And what we also found that is the same network can be trained and adapted very easily to other types of plants with just a little bit of annotation effort. 
So we have a pre-trained network, then we test it on a new data set, and then if we see that the performance is not adequate, we ask the user to very quickly annotate it, uh, and uh, the performance uh, improves. Now, finally, you will ask, well, do I do always keep to annotate new data when I go to a new domain? So if I go, for example, from our Avidopsis to, let's say, Tobacco or Komatsuna, so can we take a model trained and apply it to a new target? The quick answer is no, unless because of the specialization problem, because the model, the, the network has already specialized, the data has been seen in what we call the source domain. There is a quick solution, uh, or what we call, uh, uh, the quick solution is to label a few data, which is exactly what I showed you before. But this is intensive and in some sense not scalable because, you know, every time you, how do you know that there's a new domain and how do you know how to do this? There is an additional technique, what's we called unsupervised domain adaptation, um, where you can adapt the model without labeling extra data. So you can adapt the model, uh, you, can, you combine the data of the source domain where you do have labels and the target domain where you don't have labels, and then you can learn how to adapt the model using the, the data at the same time. Now, what we did find, though, is that most uh, biological scientists are not happy. They are more than happy, let's say, to share the model, but they may not be happy to share all the original data as well for confidentiality reasons. Um, so we did find a mechanism to do this with being confidentiality preserving by sharing only source data statistics uh, as a way to solve this. The other thing we did is rather than solving a single task, let's say counting, we asked the question, can we train a single neural network that can solve uh, a task uh, simultaneously? And let's say solve counting, measuring, the measuring, let's say, the area of a plant, the mass, the PLA, uh, and also doing genotype classification. Because some of them, it will be easier to obtain, and some of them will be able to drive that I have a single network to solve lots of different problems. And this will make actually the extraction of features better. Okay, it's a mathematical reason about learning theory of why this happens. So we did this very simple network and we did several tests where we will basically will measure um, performance of counting, um, and also performance in, uh, in, in other areas as well. And we found that we can, you can see here single and multi. So we compare here a model that has been only trained for counting versus a model that has been trained like the one that I showed you above on multi. And we found that look at 100%, the performance of a multi model is much better in measuring dice, in measuring the, the difference in count. You can also see that in the mean squared error if you want to see that, okay? It's better, always better doing solving more tasks is building than solving than one. More excitingly though, is when you have not a lot of data that are labeled, but you have for count, but you have them labeled, for example, for PLA or genotype, you can still see that you can achieve significantly good performance, consistent performance, even at a fraction of labeling count. What does that mean? That when you do multitask learning, you can use labels that are easy to collect, such as PLA, because you may have a, a, a kind of like algorithm that you have done, developed before to label the data. You may have some, let's say, genotype classification, because you already are aware of this, uh, because you know exactly what is the type of the plant uh, that you planted, and, and, and so on. So this could be easy to obtain annotations for tasks. This could be a hard one. And by doing this, the leaf count could be a hard one. So by doing that, you're actually able to leverage correlations in the data as a way to solve difficult tasks. And I think this is a fantastic result of multitask learning. Still, no matter what, you will still need to collect data. And the fundamental here is the question is, we should be able to make data collection easier. We should also be able to create algorithms that do not need perfect data. 
And you can do these algorithms that either you can create synthetic data or simulated data to train these algorithms, or you can also use noisy labels. And I'll show you some examples from our research that we have found out. First thing that we did in Fenotiki was developing a labeling tool. We wanted to create a labeling tool for leaf level segmentation, so to, 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 to segment each leaf and also be able to count. So we developed this tool that is super easy. With one minute, you can very easily segment each leaf with a lot, not a lot of effort, okay? And, uh, and this is actually built into Fenotiki. And we use the results of this tool both to train segmentation algorithms and also to train uh, leaf counting. The other thing we did is that we um, decided to use uh, crowdsourcing. So in, in actually not in reality crowdsourcing, but citizen science. So where we developed a web-based tool on the basis of Zooniverse, where uh, uh, citizens will click on the leaves that they see. And then we will present the same image several times to different people. And we will also do this to present the same image to different people, to the same person several times. So we were able to measure how consistent the same annotator is. And we will also be able to measure how, uh, how different citizens uh, behave and, and how they, they are able to label. And this was, first of all, very useful because we wanted to demonstrate the importance of phenotyping to the world, but also because we wanted to show that despite of not having perfect uh, notations, uh, in some sense, citizens can be more than happy to do some phenotyping if they believe in the cause uh, of sustainable agriculture uh, and, and, and so on. So this project is now complete because we have run out of data to label. So if you do have raw image data that you, uh, that you can share with us, please come and do share, do talk to us. It doesn't have to be Arabidopsis. It can be any any plant okay another idea is to say well if i can simulate data okay where i know a priori the ground truth information of where the leaf is and how many leaves i have that would be a perfect idea so in that case simulation annotation will come for free and there are different ideas here physics driven root driven and you can think of simple ideas of how you can uh, um, be able to simulate, in some sense, how the images would look. Now, of course, simulation is always not going to be perfect. There will be some variables of the data you are not going to be able to capture. Like, you won't be able to perfectly capture the variation of a leaf. You have to simplify it somehow. You're not going to be able to capture the diversity of the background. You're not going to be able to capture other imaging effects. So it's not possible to capture all the degrees of freedom. So then the reality is, is that useful? I think it's still useful. We're still learning a lot from this process and we actually did use uh, this work uh, as well for simulate the data. So, um, and we did use uh, uh, synthetic data as means um, to, to simulate data as means to do that. Um, so, but we also used ideas of can we learn to simulate data by looking at the data? So can we generatively create data, generating them because we have a good understanding of the data distribution of the real data? And uh, in this article, uh, I, I'm not going to go through all the detail because it's rather complex with, to describe what is a gun and so on. But uh, I just want to show you these are some clay images. And some of the images here of these plants are actually fake. So I wanted to ask the question, can you spot the fakes from the real uh, as a means to understand how good and how bad we can fool you? Now, fundamentally speaking, though, there is something that you can combine the best of both worlds. So you can think of like numerical simulation, physics-based simulation can create some caricature-looking plants, okay? Then the fundamental question is then I can actually take these caricature-looking masks and then I can create a real plant image out of this using machine learning. So, and this type of approach can actually supplement real data. Okay, it's it, it's it will have relatively fewer returns, 
But if you are able to explore more of a diversity of what you want to generate, the returns are going to be higher. Um, this is an example of how we use synthetic data where we didn't have any training data at all. So here we wanted to build this tool uh, on the Chick Root project where we wanted to segment the, 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 the roots of plants. And it was so hard to be identify a ground truth because we don't know the ground truth. You know, this is what is the what we observe from the camera. Uh, a lot of the roots are occluded by soil. So uh, we wanted to get started, but we didn't have any data at all. So in fact, we were able to synthetically create data and simulate losses on the data and create the ground truth. So we were able to take the same synthetic root that looks, you know, okay, and then introduce errors that simulate segmentation errors and use an algorithm to in-paint and fix the segmentation errors, okay? And we published a series of articles on this where we complicated even further the method. And I think the, it's, it still points to the fact that we will never be able to have lots of training data. So we need to be uh, smart and we need to be, I would say, inventive in how we combine some of the prior knowledge that we know about the problems, like how does the plant root architecture look, for example, and to make them more realistic and be uh, a bit more synthetic into how we approach the problem. Finally, I think, I think some of the, another big lesson that I found is that it's not possible to solve the problems by ourselves. So we need to believe, openly share knowledge. So we did a lot of things around this area. So, and essentially, first we built a community. So we built, for example, the, the CVPP series of workshops. There is IPPN that we are involved. There is Phenom UK. There is the working group. Then we start sharing also data. So, and that's something very important. We were together with Hanno uh, and some of our students, we developed the first open data set of solving computer vision problems for phenotyping in, uh, in uh, uh, labeled data. And we published it in a computer vision journal on purpose. So, and we saw, we produced, provided data and annotations and also evaluation routines. Funnily enough, this data set was tricky enough and small enough to allow the computer vision community, machine learning community to use it without, without being experts. So in the, they didn't need to be experts in plant phenotyping because we mapped the problems of fun, plant phenotyping to problems that are related to computer vision. Okay, And this way led to a blow up of how many people are using the data? And in fact, uh, several things have happened. We found that only a third of the people downloading the data are computer vision scientists that work with plants. We found a lot of different people are using the data and different types of professional expertise. Most of them are actually at PhD students and researchers, okay? And most of them are in computer vision has nothing to do with plants. So we are teaching a lot of students, a lot of people uh, about how important phenotyping is just because we are providing them a data set. Um, and hopefully we'll convince some of these people to say, you know what, rather than work for computer vision in autonomous driving or computer vision for face detection or cat and dog detection, I'll work for phenotyping for an agricultural company or for a breeder or for, uh, I'll be a data scientist as a breeder. In fact, two of my PhD students started with medical and then they actually then ended up becoming data scientists in agriculture uh, and vice versa. So I had one of my PhD students that did medical and now works uh, in, um, in agriculture. And then I had one that did agriculture and now works uh, in, uh, as a general data scientist. But Critically, though, this was the biggest gain. So in, in a follow-up article, after the five years that had passed from releasing the data set, we showed that if you make a data set open, you can monitor progress. So we found that 
let's say this is the accuracy here that we observed as an algorithm of an algorithm of that had 74 percent accuracy of segmenting a leaf like delineating a leaf and if you noticed throughout the years by other people adopting the algorithm performance went to 90 percent adopting and changing the algorithm trusting new algorithms they went to 90. in counting we went from 2.6 absolute count difference to 0 0.7 in less than five years and not by us working on the data but people outside even outside our community of the sense of phenotyping. So the outsiders are able to use different type of technologies like recurrent neural networks and very complicated models as a way to do uh, segmentation and I mean and also counting. Okay. Um, and overall it has amplified extensively what we have done as part of the community. When we released the data set the first time, we also had a challenge within this part of the computer vision workshop. And we invited the plant phenotyping community at that point to compete. And we'd start to working again uh, with each other. And in fact, lots of different people at that time used the combination of classical computer vision algorithms like watersheds, super pixels uh, from Nottingham, um, uh, or uh, some sort of, um, uh, again, you know, distance map calculations and, and, and so on, and graph cuts. Some others used uh, template matching, okay? These are all, again, ideas that were pretty deep learning. So you can see how, although our community started with pretty deep learning and came up with solutions, very quickly, the data set was so useful across a broader range of people. So one of the first things that we did actually was to capture a collection of performance at that point of time in terms of uh, solving their problem. And we organized this competition. And at that point, four different groups participated. And we observed that collectively now, because on the data are standardized, how performance varies and where do we need to focus. And we didn't want to stop there. We continued in making others becoming more involved. So this computer vision works keep going now, keeps going now on a yearly basis. So by now, we have almost you know, seven years in the running, eight years in the running, and this year is going to be in ICCV. And we have now expanded to additional problems in plant phenotyping and agriculture. So to conclude the first part of the talk, so analysis of data is now the new bottleneck and there is very challenging computer vision problems and opportunities but we need to do uh, more in order to solve some of the problems we need to be smart in how we scale up the solutions and to be able to make the efforts that we develop reusable and machine learning will definitely help but i think we do need more help with open data open infrastructures open data sources and hopefully emphasis will help with that uh, but in general, I think we need to be more strategic about how we tackle these problems and how we grow the community of people working on these problems. This concludes the part about uh, uh, phenotyping um, and phenotyping in general. The next part is very brief. It's going to talk about advice on software design and how do you create a software sustainable. It's just one slide. Uh, but I'll talk over it a lot. Okay. So I think I, I think this is something that I didn't expect when I started this work, and I real quickly realized that building a software is totally different than building an algorithm or, or a paper. the The first Fenotiki grant actually was only a hundred thousand euro. In reality, as an investment. It took two PhD students and one postdoc six years to develop it. So more like five times the actual cost of what the original grant was. And it was a lot of personal and institutional investment to make that happen. The other thing I realized is that it needs a complete diversity of skills in terms of how we develop this. So you don't need people only good at machine learning. You don't need people that are only good in computer vision. You need people that I can easily understand what it means to put an infrastructure together, how to put a framework, 
of learning libraries and functions, how to create an API that it can make a software being reusable. Then on top of that, you need to have an algorithm, sorry, you need to have a skill set of a person where is able to work and develop a good user interface that is going to be easy, straightforward. Then you need to have uh, the ability of people to, a bunch of people that are able to test your, test your software and give you feedback. So having a user base is actually very important. They give you feedback. They provide corrections. They provide resources. They provide uh, useful information that you need as a way to improve the software. Um, finding a good user base for a, for a, for a software uh, that is completely free, by the way, it was not an easy thing. At the same time, because you cannot keep developing this for free, okay? You need, uh, if you want to keep it for free, you need to find ways to support it for free. So a volunteer developer base is extremely important. As of now, we haven't had a single contribution from the community, despite the hundreds of downloads of the software, in terms of how to fix things and how to build this up together. So it's still too small, I guess, the community of the users, or too bespoke the software, I guess, to be more uh, open and openly used. And I think what I didn't expect how important it is, is to have a market. A market, and what I mean by market is not a market of necessarily economic market for that, but a market like a large user base that sees the value that is able to put it back. So since we released Fenotiki in 2015, if we have continued to support it by, in some sense, donated labor, in sense like PhD students funded by other programs that are able to put some of the time and fix some of the bugs or improve functionality or improve the algorithms. Um, in that sense, in that time, we, was transition, we wanted to transition from MATLAB to Python, and Python needed a complete refactoring. So we were not able to find somebody who can design an interface completely new in Python, uh, uh, because it would have taken maybe like six months. It took six to eight months to do the previous one. So we would assume that it will take another six, eight months. Um, and unfortunately, there are no funding mechanisms that allow you to ask for funding to improve a software. There are funding mechanisms to solve a scientific question, but there are no funding mechanisms that you can take to improve software. And as of now, it seems that it's been uh, very, very hard in being able to keep it going, despite that all of us are vested in it and we really um, love the problems, solving the problem. So I, I, I really hope that this provides you some advice if you want to develop your own software, that you want to think is going to contribute to the community, what sort of you should expect uh, as potential issues that you might face uh, in, in the future. In the last uh, phase, I'll talk to you about developing AI in general, some of examples and lessons that I've learned to how to do better AI research. So these are six lessons. And I'll go over those lessons uh, with you. First is to review a bit the bias and virus dilemma and what does it mean to overfit versus underfit and use this as means to inform how you split your sets. Do not rely too much on luck and be smart about how you document some of your ideas and how you develop some hyperparameters. And try to avoid problems where they're part of the data rates. So bias and virus dilemma. So I think you you can probably have experience now that it's very easy to train a machine learning algorithm to actually zero training error. So with neural networks, you can actually theoretically, the theory says that you can go to training error of zero. But in reality, that's not really what matters. It's not how the algorithm performs on, on the training data, but it how uh, performs on new and unseen data that are not the same as the training data. So, for example, if you train an algorithm to detect animals, uh, and these were, let's say, some of the normal animals that you saw in the training set, you want to also be able to detect a cat here and not make a mistake or not create an algorithm that is going to throw an error. And largely how the algorithm will behave is it will, it will behave well if 
it has the algorithm has well understood the underlying structure of the data. What does it mean to extract? Um, what does it mean to extract, for example, some good features? Let's say uh, the, the shape of a nose of a cat or the shape of its ears versus that of the dog. And we will say that that the algorithm generalizes well to unseen data when it will behave well also to new and unseen data. So the way we do this is actually we split the training set. So we split uh, the training sets with respect to uh, a training set, a testing set, and a validation set. Overall, we know that if the model is too simple, uh, it will have high bias. It will, uh, it will underfit. Okay? If it's too complex, it will overfit. There is theoretical tools that we can use to analyze and understand that, but the practical perspective is that you need to have essentially three splits of your training set. Um, so you will take the original training set, you will um, you will split it in three pieces, okay? Three pieces here. One piece is the training, another piece is the validation, and finally there is the testing set. The testing set you never, never touch. You leave it aside. So you use the training set as a way to train the model, and you use the validation set as a way to optimize certain parameters of the model, like what sort of shape of the neural network you should have, what hyperparameters, and, and so on. And also, the way you structure the learning set, it's very important. So the typical of training, validation, and testing you should also be careful about data leakage. You should be careful about, for example, if you have a longitudinal collection of images of a plant, you do not want to split the ID across of a plant in different parts of the training set and the testing set. You want to say that I will use the plant ID one as a testing set directly um, and leave uh, uh, and use all the time points of the other uh, uh, training set. Uh, as well. Um, so I think it, it largely depends on your problem, but this is something that is very common of creating data leakage because you're essentially, if you had trained on some of the data of the image of that plant uh, up to, let's say, time day 50, and then you say, well, I'm going to see how well it's going to do from time 50 to time 60, uh, you're not necessarily evaluating the performance of the algorithm without taking some of the correlations into account. So you need to be careful of that. Um, you also need to be careful about how you use some statistics. Like if you're using t-tests as a way to measure the performance of your algorithm versus, versus another one, when you're using cross-validation, uh, there's lots of discussion on the internet about that uh, in generally in some of the textbooks about the use of stats in machine learning. There are some nice uh, um, uh, papers as well. So this is how I want to give you some advice, I think, about how you might want to think of split your uh, sets. And I, I see a lot of students now working really hard in trying to, you know, always test the algorithm on all the data set uh, as well. So I think this is what I used to do when I was a student. Uh, and we didn't actually have very powerful computers. And we always had to run things on a central uh, server. So I used to have something that I would call the coffee set. Uh, and this is something that I was able to run in my very puny, tiny laptop then, uh, where it will be images with have, let's say, fewer data or smaller resolution. And I use it to quickly try ideas and solutions. And that will take a few minutes, I think. Uh, that's how I planned it in my mind. I should be able to do a very quick test in a few minutes. Then I had the lunch set, something that will take one or two hours will be a bit larger in size or size a larger dimension. I just wanted to show whether the idea that I developed and worked well in the coffee set, will it also work well on the fluke, or on, the, on the larger set? And it's not going to be something random. Then I used to call the sleep set. And this is actually extremely important. Something that you're able to run overnight when you sleep. So the idea is to use your computer when you sleep to obtain some fi some findings that you can increase your confidence in your approach. And finally, there is a production set. This will take as long as it needed and you use to get the numbers you need. So this is how I actually was structuring my day.
uh, as, a, as a student. So I'll wake up in the morning, and when I wake up in the morning, I will check the performance on the sleep results, okay, that run overnight. Then I will use the blue time. The blue time means I'm thinking about what I should be doing, get some ideas, what should I be improving next. And then I run my coffee set on based on some of the ideas. Then I will check my coffee results. I'll think about it a bit more. And then by one o'clock, I can run actually my lunch set results. Then I'll go for lunch for an hour. Then I'll check my lunch set results. Then I'll keep thinking a bit more, maybe you know, for two hours. Then run my coffee set results again. Check my coffee sets results and keep thinking. And then at six o'clock, very quickly, I will set up a coffee set, see if it works, and then immediately then after I run the sleep set result, uh, and then the cycle with repeat. So I was able to do some quick testing of ideas um, before uh, 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 I was able to run fully on the production set. What is important in order for this thing to work, you need to have your own evaluation protocol very early on. So you need to know how are you going to measure performance? How are you going to measure and evaluate performance and so on? So this is something that remains uh, critical in, in, in to identify how are you going to evaluate and early on. The other thing that I observe a, a lot is that luck is important, but you know it's lucky to get the architecture right the first time. It's lucky to pick the right design the first time. It's lucky for your first idea to work or the first hyperparameters to work. But luck or the force is not going to be the panacea. So luck won't fix a broken method. So instead, try to debug method uh, in a nice methodological manner, in methodical. Um, don't hope that a different hyperparameter will fix it. It's very common that I see students say, well, I'm going to try this different hyperparameter. It's going to make magic. No, that's not going to probably be the true. So, and also adding new losses and complicating more the learning problem will not fix a badly set up problem. So just take a step back and really think about uh, how you want to approach uh, the solution. Also, I think a lot of the students go and spend time like trying by themselves about better hyperparameters or better network designs, or how are you going to balance the losses? Uh, you know, the, the parameters of the optimization tool, uh, the, the large the batch size or the learning rate. There are some optimal parameters there. There are, sorry, there are some optimal approaches. They're not easy to implement, but there is definitely built-in tools in TensorFlow, PyTorch, Python, that you can use hyper Bayesian hyper-optimization to do this without relying on yourself. So, and of course, you will spend compute but at least it's not your time. But still, despite this day, we call the best of way to, in some sense, find new ideas and new hyperparameters, it's graduate student descent. Uh, mostly because people don't have enough compute or they don't want to set up the idea, they want to set up the framework of running all of these things uh, as a grid optimization uh, search or hyperparameter optimization search. The other thing, that I think it's important is to document your ideas. So let's say this is you uh, when you have a cool idea, and we'll call this idea one. You put it on the computer, you implement it, you get some results. Oh, they didn't work. Then you have another idea, and maybe that idea okay is not as great, this not as good as the beginning. Then you test it again. Then you go. You can finally you made it work with the idea number a hundred. Okay, so. What is the fundamental thing, though, is that remember something about luck. There is lots of parts in the process that need to work in order for the idea and its utility to manifest. So if uh, you have luck, it might mean that idea work, idea 100 made it work, but there is also a luck aspect. Maybe you also fix some bug in the code, or you also fix something the way you normalize the data, or you way pre-process the data. So it could still be that idea number one is good. So keep a logbook of your ideas and go back to idea number one when you got things working. Sometimes the first idea could be the best idea. So you never know. So bottom line is keep a good logbook of what you do uh, because it basically if we follow Seneca, uh, the philosopher, uh, it said like luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So you need to be prepared by creating this logbook 
uh, such that when you're lucky that something works, then you can create a new opportunity by going and revisiting some of your ideas. Finally, I want to talk to you about the data race. So I, I find that a lot of people want to work on the hottest problems. Um, and, and I think the hottest problems also have the biggest amount of data. But I think it's, it's a race like that. So it, it means that you need to collect more data in order to do better, or you need to beat people that have more compute power. I think it's easier to be able to use our own brain power into problems where they do not have lots of data. And perhaps you might come up with solutions that will be useful also for others that hold, that also have a lot of data. So I, I kind of like the idea of uh, working in problems where data are at a limit. And to be honest, according to my opinion, all, day, all problems are at a data of a limit, as according to what I showed you before about the combinatorial explosion. So I think with this, I would like to conclude uh, these uh, presentations. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and enjoyed the material presented. I would like to thank my team for all of their hard work um, that they put together, acknowledge my lab and my students who worked on these problems a lot. Uh, that I showed you to be here, the thousands of citizens that label data and some of the collaborators across the world, uh, my, uh, my funders uh, and uh, yourselves. Uh, thank you very much. Here is also a list of papers uh, that you can also find online. And the website is also listed here. And my email, you can always email me for questions. And all the papers and all the code of what we develop is freely available. Thank you.